Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leslie Grill, the project coordinator for the Southeast Organic Partnership, and we're here today. Uh, we have the privilege um, to hear from our entomologist, uh, Dr. Franklin Quarku, and uh, he also has in the background there uh, his graduate assistant, uh, Sona Corala. And so we welcome you both. And we have the tomato uh, insect management in the organic production of tomatoes. Uh, presentation ready to go. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Korku, uh, as long as uh, Alice lets us know we are recording. I don't see the record button, uh, or I don't see the record light on, so. That's all right, we are recording. Oh, okay, perfect. All right, so Dr. Korku, I will let you take it away. Okay, uh, is Dr. Chichui uh, uh, online? I don't see her yet. I'll I will um, message her and and see if she's okay. having Okay. Okay. And I'll mute me. I'm out. Yes. So we are going to talk about um, insect pest management in uh, organic production of tomatoes. Uh, and when we talk about just the insects alone, it's a lot of information. So I won't be able to go into details on every insect. I will, however, be able to share some general management principles. And for some of the insects, I'll get a little bit more specific uh, that can be used to solve some of these pest problems. So the key thing is actually prevent them uh, if we can uh, do, do that. And um, this is, I, I say this all the time uh, in every presentation that I do, and I want to say that again. Um, if a hammer is all that you have in your toolbox, every problem begins to look like a nail. And what I want is that if you let pesticides represent the only tool you have in your toolbox, then you act in ways to put yourself in a situation where you have no choice but to use pesticides. So in IPM, pesticides are actually like a, a last resort, or if, even if you are going to use it, you are trying to incorporate it into other preventive measures so that you don't have to rely too much on these pesticides. And even if you have to use them, not so often, especially for organic production where most of the time, um, pesticides that are available to us do not present the kind of quick fixes that the conventional pesticides do. So basically, an organic farmer cannot afford to detect pest problems very late. Because if you detect it late, the conventional farmer has a tool that is able to deal with the problem a lot quicker than most of the conventional products are able to. So basically, what I'm stressing here is do all the preventive measures so you don't put yourself in a situation where you have to use pesticides. And then the list of pesticides available to you take a little while to get the job done. They are also usually more expensive. They usually have to be sprayed a few more times than the conventional product, so labor costs and all of that. Um, so uh, this chart is just showing uh, what kind of, uh, so I know the, the first few slides, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I still need to talk about this. If we put ourselves in a situation where we always have to depend on pesticides, we put ourselves in this kind of um, vicious cycle where we start with pesticides, we have pest problems, we, uh, we misuse or not, do not use these pesticides pro properly. So the pests develop resistance. They re develop resistance, then we have resurgence, so we have more pests. So we have to use more insecticides. We keep moving from the center outwards and it's not a good direction. Okay. So, uh, and I'll not talk about this. This just talks about some of the things we do with pesticides where uh, some lower organisms uh, have it, some people feed on it, they concentrate it to higher levels until the top predators have far higher than is safe for any organism. So these are some of the things, um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, so the, all these health effects that we, we talked about. So now let me start getting to why we're here today. So in general, pest management methods can be grouped into two major categories. You are either preventing the problem from happening 
or you are trying to cure an existing problem. Uh, for the reasons I explained earlier, you want to put yourself uh, in the situation where you are trying to prevent the problem. So if you have a farm in, um, uh, uh, let's say Tuskegee, and you know you are growing salving peas, and the salving peas are uh, very susceptible to, let's say, sting bat. And then you have another field somewhere in Mississippi, and you can afford to grow the southern peas there, and that area it doesn't record a lot of sting bats. Just the mere decision to grow the southern peas in Mississippi instead of here, that site selection is a pest management practice. You are trying to avoid the pest problem by just selecting a location where that pest is not known to occur in high population. If you also decide to select a variety that is able to, that is tolerant to the activities of that pest, that also helps. It's a preventive practice because you don't do that when you have the pest problems in the field. You do, you have to take that decision before. So the preventive practices, you have to make the decision before uh, um, uh, the pest situation happens. The curative practices, or the therapeutic practices are different. That one, you actually have the problem and you have to do something. Either you are doing hand picking using pesticides or vacuum equipment. There are all kinds of things, but all the things I'm going to be talking about today are going to be categorized either as preventive practices or uh, curative or treatment kind of practices. Now, let me talk about some general preventive and cultural insect pest management practices. Uh, I'm starting with weed management for, for, for a good reason. Sometimes you are doing all the things you need to do, but you have so many weeds that these weeds are providing harborage. These weeds are providing harborage uh, or a shelter to some of these pests. There are actually certain pests that attack vegetable crops and most other crops. Yes, they are feeding on the crop, but the crop doesn't provide the kind of environment that they usually would like to take shelter in. So if you have a weed situation in the field, which is creating shelter for the pests, then it becomes ideal because, okay, now we have our food here and we also have shelter here, so we don't have to go anywhere. So they become resident on your farm and then they do a lot of damage. So one of the things is to provide an environment that is not suitable for the pest. Sometimes that unsuitable environment is a pesticide, but other times it's just presence of plants, that are not hosts but provide good canopy and good hiding place for the, the pest. Now, talking about weed management, sometimes we use mulch to, uh, mulch to manage weeds. Well, some of these mulches help us to uh, um, go against certain pests, like the reflective mulches. What they do sometimes is that a lot of sunlight bounces off these reflective mulches and it affects some of the in flying insect pests, it affects their ability to locate the plant. What actually happens is that so much light or glare is bouncing off that um, reflective mulch that the insect, the way its eye is, it cannot see the plant. The plant is on top of the mulch, but the insect cannot see the, uh, the, 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 the plant. And the way insects identify plants, sometimes from a distance, they see the general architecture of the plant, they start coming near. It gets to a point before they, they start smelling certain essences from the plant in order to determine this may be a suitable host. So if you can fool them from far off where the bouncing light is such that they don't even want to come close to that farm area, then you don't have to run into the pest problems to start with. But all the things I talk about Today, let's be careful. Any pest management method you use, you have to consider the cost implications. How much am I going to sell this produce? This management method may sound great, but how much does it inflate my cost of production? 
And am I going to be able to sell this produce at a price where it justifies the amount of money I spent trying to deal with this space? In other words, do not deal with a 200, do not spend a thousand dollars dealing with a $200 problem. By $200, I mean that we've estimated that if we allow these thing bags to do all the damage they can do, we will lose about $200 worth of the solving piece. Well, if it's going to cost you $1,000 to spray the recommended pesticide, that actually means you are solving a $200 problem with $1,000. Uh, it doesn't make financial sense. So all of these things that I'm talking about, even if I don't mention it again, you have to look at the cost implications before you use any of these methods, okay? How much pest reduction, how much in injury, reduction in injury do you get by using that pest management method? Uh, how much reduction in crop damage do you get? Uh, you have to look at that before you select any of these methods. Trap cropping. For those who are growing southern peas, tomatoes, and stuff, if we have things like a squash, uh, we have leaf-footed bags. Well, they will come for your plant, uh, but research has been done, and people will actually use this successfully. When you grow other plants that the insects prefer, sometimes they just those plants. They simply prefer those plants. Or sometimes it is the same crop variety, but you grow it earlier than your main crop. And sometimes this is done on the periphery of your main crop. So the, the pests have access to that one first because it is at the stage of growth that is suitable for them. They go for it, by, and then they don't go for your plants that are in the middle. But one of the things you have to be careful of when we, when we use trap uh, cropping is that a number of times, if you know the direction that the pests are coming from, if they are coming from one side of the field, you can just put your trap crops across that line. If, 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 if the pests are coming from this side of the field, you put your trap crops here, then that's okay. If you do not yet know where these pests are coming from, what is normally recommended is that you have the trap crops all around your field. And then you monitor all these different uh, sites to see, okay, where am I recording this pest? So the next year, you don't have to put the boundaries or the trap crops at the other area. Because remember that each time you use your land area to grow a trap crop, which by definition you don't plan on harvesting or feeding on, that's a, an area of land you, you are not using to, sp uh, to grow the, your main crop. So you don't want to put trap crops all over the place and occupy a, land, uh, a large acreage, and then that's not what you want to harvest. Another reason why trap crops, especially for conventional gro gro uh, growers, uh, is you have to be very careful how much trap crop you have, is that technically you are not supposed to harvest and feed on the trap crop because for conventional growers, you are usually spraying the trap crop with pesticides uh, in a way that assists the label, sometimes the label instructions concerning what you can spray your pesticides with and still feed on it. But because you are not going to feed on that, you can attack the insects more aggressively in the trap crop and then you leave your main crops alone. So one problem with trap crops in organic farming is that if you now trap the pests around the main crop and you don't have a pesticide that is really good at wiping them out in the trap crop, what what ends up happening is that you are just basically, the, your trap crop has just become a nursery that is sort of attracting the pests, uh, growing them, and then when they are no longer satisfied with whatever the trap crop offers, they will just move on to your main crop. So you have to have something that you can use to deal with them when they are still in the trap crop. Uh, otherwise, this method may not be suitable for organic growers. Uh, and basically you just develop a nursery of pests.
The next thing that I'll talk about, and later on I'll go to some individual uh, pairs and, 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 and make some statements, but some of the things I'm talk, talking about here are going to apply to uh, a number of those pairs anyway. Crop rotation, we know what crop rotation is, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but I've noticed that some people rotate crops uh, based on the wrong reasons when they are trying to uh, uh, manage insect pests. Uh, the agronomists and horticulturists, when they are talking about crop rotation, they will let you know uh, in order to use the um, nutrient resources from the soil or optimize the, the, um, um, the use of nutrient resources from the soil, you follow a deep-rooted plan with a shallow rooted one so that you are taking nutrients from different regions of the soil and stuff like that. That is great. But when you are monitoring, when you are trying to manage pests using uh, crop rotation, there's another consideration. You may follow a sharp, uh, shallow rooted crop with a deep rooted crop, but both of them may be within the host range of the pests you are trying to manage. If that happens, all you've succeeded in doing is changing what's on the menu. It doesn't solve the problem. You have changed what's on the menu and you may actually have switched to a crop that the pest actually prefers. So um, um, that's one of the things I want to point out about crop rotation. Another thing I want to point out is target planting. If you are supplying a um, 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 a, a large chain shop or retailer where they need large volumes, but they don't need all, all of what you have at the same time. They want you to stagger it. Okay, you plant the first set of crops. Today, maybe 10 days later, you plant the next batch. So every week you are harvesting something that you can send to uh, um, the shop where you, uh, the, the folks you supply. That is great. But for insect pest management, if you stagger your crops, please do not stagger them next to each other. So if I plant something on the 10th of April and the plan is to plant the next set on the 20th of April, I cannot do that right next to the one I planted on the 10th of April because what ends up happening is that most of these insects, um, um, including some of the soft-bodied ones, especially the piercing sucking insects that like to pierce the plant tissue and suck sap out of them. They prefer plants that are young or fresh, have a high moisture content and all those things. Now, if you start up plants right next to each other and the previous crop is no longer attractive because of its stage of growth, the plants will just simply migrate to the next plot right next to it. That's why when you do target planting, you want to move that nest set somewhere else. Irrigation and water management may not sound like pest management practices. Well, technically they are not pest management practices in a sense, but they are pest management implications. Generally, the healthier a plant is, the more tolerant they are of pests. So if the plant is healthy, the, the action threshold or the uh, decision point where you will typically be required to spray goes higher. So what's happening is that the, maybe last year you didn't apply the nutrients and the water that the plants needed. And so you had uh, 50 aphids per plant. And then the recommendation was, okay, uh, with this uh, population of aphids, you have to spray. Well, this year you have um, given the plants all the water they need, all the nutrients. And now we are saying, well, you, this plant will be able to tolerate up to about 70 of them per plant. So that is going to be saving you a lot of money because the plant, and what we mean by tolerance is that if in spite of the activities of the insect, in spite of the injury that they may be causing to the plant, that injury does not result in a measurable reduction in yield, which is what you want. So keeping your plants healthy so when the agronomists and the horticulturists recommend that you do the soil test, apply, use uh, the nutrients that you need, uh, let the plants have enough moisture uh, or water in the soil, all of these things have pest management implications. 
Now, let me go back to farmscaping, uh, which I skipped for, for a reason. Basically, this involves you are actually planting some benefit, some plants around your farm that attract beneficial insects to your farm, and then they get to solve some of your pest problems. So this is intentional. This is like landscaping, but it's supposed to bring helpers to deal with your pest problems. There are when we come to the curative practices this we are no longer talking about preventive ones well and for the preventive uh, one of the things I, I don't know whether I talk about uh, well I did talk about that that's uh, the use of resistant varieties now if we get to the curative practices early detection is key if you you can have the best pesticides the the fastest acting pesticides uh, but if you detect your problem too late especially when the crops have been completely damaged to the point where the re recovery is not an option. <coughs> then application of pesticides is no longer useful. Early detection is good, but if you don't know what you're looking at, I don't know what you'll be detecting. So that's why Dr. Chituri um, uh, prepared a, a pest uh, ID guide that uh, hopefully has been, everybody has access to that. You have to know what you're looking at. If you look at the pest and you misidentify it or you, you are looking at a beneficial insect that you actually think is a pest and you start spraying them, then you are beginning to uh, uh, sort of uh, attack your allies or your friends. Not every stink bug, for example, is a pest. There are stink bugs that are beneficial insects that feed on other pests that attack tomatoes. So uh, typically you notice that the stink bugs that are beneficial, their are mouth parts, they are thicker, broader, they are not as uh, needle-like like the, 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 the pest species. So you have to know what you're looking at, identify them properly, so you don't go uh, sort of uh, killing your, your, your allies. The other thing that we need to talk about is that if you have identified your pest properly, you have detected it early. But, okay, even the early detection is a doubtful based on what I'm going to say, but you are not using the relevant threshold. So basically what you are, you have a recommendation that says if you have 20 of these insects in um, Mississippi, or uh, a particular city in Mississippi, you have to spray. Well, that recommendation may not work for somebody in Arizona, okay? So you, you have to be using relevant treatment thresholds based on your area uh, that sort of make sure that you don't waste money and you get the best result out of what you're doing. Of course, you have to follow label uh, restrictions, uh, instructions and importantly, a number of these uh, organic pesticides and conventional pesticides, I might add, need to be rotated just because if you keep, uh, and I talk to a number of farmers, and then they tell me, I love this pesticide. I've been using it for 15 years. And sometimes I'm trying to make a recommendation to switch to something else. And then they'll say, Sam, I've been using this for 15 years, and um, it's worked for me. And it, they, the way I look at it, I'm thinking if you've been using it for 15 years, that's precisely the reason you should switch to something else if you want it to continue doing what you say it, it, it does. Because um, you keep doing that, the insects uh, develop resistance and that very good product that you like uh, will no longer get the job done. Let's talk about a specific insect, for example, for uh, tomatoes, if you are dealing with hornworms, and a few uh, other um, uh, caterpillars or uh, worm kind of pests. Well, you may spray the right pesticide, including spinosad uh, or uh, any of these uh, Bacillus uh, Bt products, which are all good against this worm pests of, uh, uh, of tomatoes. But if you detect the problem late, and these hornworms are <coughs> are large, 
it has been observed that these pesticides are not as effective against them when they are that big as compared to when they are small. So that brings it back to early detection. Uh, so early detection is key when the, they are still small, so the pesticide does the best job against them. Also note that a number of these biopesticides are unstable in the presence of sunlight. That's why sometimes they tell you spray in the late afternoon or in the evening if you can, uh, because that gives you overnight for that pesticide to, to be active, uh, because for some of them, you spray them in the morning, sunlight throughout the day, it breaks them down into products that are not really active against the pest that you may be trying to deal with. One of the problems that I want to talk about is the name we give insects. You see, this insect right here is called the corn earworm. It is also called a tomato fruitworm. It is also called the cotton bollworm which is a problem because when farmers communicate with each other, if my neighbor is growing uh, cotton and I'm growing tomato and he tells me he's been having some problems with the cotton bollworm, I may be thinking I don't have to worry about that, I'm growing tomatoes, but the cotton bollworm is also known as a tomato fruitworm. So we, uh, sometimes when you give us a call and you tell us I'm having this problem or the other, uh, we ask for pictures. You are telling us what the pest is. It's not like we don't trust you. Uh, sometimes misidentification of pests can lead us in uh, wrong directions. And sometimes you are referring to the pest by a name that we are not familiar with. So we just want to be sure what we are dealing with. Now talking about uh, this tomato fruit worm, there are a number of uh, 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 beneficial insects that help us uh, to control them. But like I said, farmscaping, planting the right crops that bring those pre predators or attract them to the crop are going to be very useful. The damage this does, they just burrow into the fruit and chew large holes. And after they've done their uh, damage, no, nobody um, is or will be interested in those fruits. But there are beneficial insects that uh, parasitoids that help against this pest, but you have to have your farm provide favorable conditions that bring these beneficial insects to your field. I'm going to be talking about the hornworm briefly. Uh, typically, if your farm is not, uh, Leslie, how many minutes do I have? Hello. Dr. Yes, Dr. Cork, can you hear me? Yeah, how many minutes do um, I have? I would say under, I would say maybe five to seven minutes or so. Um, I know there's okay. so much to talk about, oh. but okay. <laughs> I want to make sure we give time for questions. Yeah, I'll keep going. Thank you so much. Okay. Check the time and make sure I'm on time, okay? All right. This is a hornworm. Uh, for most tomato growers, we know they do a lot of damage. They bite off the leaves, cause all kinds of problems. When they strip the plant bare, of course, the plant is photosynthesis doesn't occur like it should. So the plant won't be able to produce the size, the, the, the kind of tomatoes that you want. I mean, the, 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 the quantity that, that, that you want. So these are not our friends, this tomato hornworm. We call it a hornworm. I don't know whether you can see that there's actually a horn here. We call it a hornworm. So typically, if your farm is not that large, it makes more financial. If it's just a, a small uh, area that you are growing this in, hand picking is recommended for this pest. Basically, you have a bucket of soapy water, and then you just move from plant to plant, pick these uh, hornworms, drop them in the soapy water. Later on, you just dig a hole somewhere and pour that in and cover it up. That, that solves the problem. That is not something anybody will recommend for somebody who has a large acreage of tomatoes, okay? Another problem with doing hand picking is that some people just don't want to hold these things, so uh, that's a problem. Another thing that has been observed is that it look, you see, they are cryptic nature. You know, they camouflage themselves that so well. And then when they realize that somebody is moving in the field, uh, it's been observed that they, they, they just sit still. 
they don't move. So you have to have a good eye to be able to spot them if, you, if, if hand picking is going to be your method of choice. I use this particular picture because of this X that we have here. These are the X of a parasitoid, a fly, that what basically this does is that they are going to hatch out, they are going to eat this uh, um, um, uh, worm uh, inside out and then just um, um, destroy it totally. Now, when you are walking through your field trying to do the hand picking that I talked about earlier, and you see a worm that has this parasitoid eggs on them, do not take this out. This individual has just been converted from a, a foe or an enemy to an ally because now it's serving as an incubator, a source of food for this parasitoid and then they will make more of them reproduce and then so you are going to be dealing with your problems a lot better. Also the reason, another reason you don't need to pick out this individual is that normally at, by this stage of the infestation, they are no longer actively feeding. Okay, they are no longer actively feeding, so you don't have to worry about this one that has the eggs on them. Just leave them alone. I know it doesn't feel like the right thing to do. You are looking at a worm that feeds on your crop, and I'm asking you to leave it on there. But trust me, this individual you are looking at right now is now an ally and not a, an enemy. Another thing I, I, I would want to talk about for tomatoes, uh, we have aphids as well. Um, they, we all know the they TS and SAG, they, they sap and the juice out of the plant. If you are monitoring your field for aphids, you can very easily miss an aphid infestation if you don't monitor for them the right way. This Dr. Dr. Cork, I'm so sorry. Let me, let me interrupt for just one second because I don't want to miss any of this information. I think you, you should just be able to go ahead and go. But I do want to take a quick break. I'm so sorry uh, to interrupt you there, but just want to make sure that nobody has any questions up until this point. That's good. And if you, if you do, go ahead and chime in. And I don't think Dr. Parker will mind if you, if you interrupt him. I just did, so. <laughs> okay. Um, now, let me, let me say this before you continue. I actually prefer that method of uh, presentation than okay. what I'm doing right now. Perfect. In fact, well, I prefer the interruptions. Okay, sounds good. Well, you've got the word, everybody. So if you have a question, go ahead and interrupt him. I'm just going to let you go because this is such valuable information that we definitely don't want to cut it short. Um, and we're going until one today. So that's 23 minutes. So please, if you have questions, make sure to, to interrupt <laughs> And just unmute your microphone and then mute it back. Okay, back to you. Okay, so uh, one of the key things about aphids is that if you are monitoring for them the wrong way, you might have aphids and it may take you, it, it may be too late when you realize you have an aphid infestation. Okay? Because typically they like to be on the underside of the leaves. So if you are monitoring your field and you are looking at the leaves from the top, it may appear that everything is fine. What you need to do is to hold the leaves and turn them over and look under them. You might find these fellows under the leaves. The damage they do is not just because they pierce the plant and suck the juice out of the plant, which is not good. Sucking the juice out of any living thing is not a desirable situation. So that in itself is bad. The other problem is that the back side, uh, they release, they, from this side, they release some waxy material. They also produce what we call honeydew. So the general observation is that they, uh, then on these leaves, you are going to have this sticky material that's on the leaves. That sticky material is going to sort of trap uh, um, fungal spores, which I want you to think about like pollen in the air. When they trap those fungal pore, uh, spores, it's going to result in this sooty mold, so black, so the leaves turn black. Well, that's not very good for the plant because it reduces the photosynthetic capacity of the plant, and so that, that's also another problem right there. So, we started off with taking the juice out of the plant, which is not good. Now we have reduction in food production or photosynthesis by, by, by the plant, which is also bad. 
Now, these insects also, when they pierce into the plant, if they are already infected with a, a pathogen or a disease-causing organism, they are going to transmit it to the plant, and then you have virus issues. If you have virus issues, there is no product anybody can give you that can treat the virus problem. The best way to deal with it is to deal with the insects that transmit the virus. The other thing you can do is to have the adequate nutrients, the right amount of water, so hopefully the plant can fight and tolerate the virus or be able to do what it's supposed to do in spite of the um, presence of the virus. But there is nothing that can be used to spray uh, that. Uh, just a second. The reason I put this is that these ladybugs feed on the aphids. And so you have to watch the insect interactions that are on your farm. Sometimes you know you have aphids because you are seeing a lot of ladybugs. Sometimes you, you don't get to see the problem first, you see the solution first. And sometimes you know you have the aphids because you see a number of ants as well. The reason the ants are there is that they like the honeydew that is produced by the aphids. But the reason uh, you see this ant trying to attack the, the, the ladybug is that the ladybug feeds on the aphid. The ladybug is on our side. It's trying to feed on the pest that is attacking our crop. But because it produces honeydew that these ants love, the ants defend the lady, uh, aphids against the ladybug. So you have to be very cognizant of some of these insect interactions that are going on in your field. I, I described the trap cropping earlier, so I don't want to go over it. Basically, your main crop is in the middle. You have the trap crop on all sides, and then it sort of traps the, the, the pest to a location where it's a central location. You can focus your pesticide application or whatever you want to do there so you don't have to spread those efforts over a much larger area, which is your main crop that you want to um, um, uh, harvest from. So there are different types of trap crops that are used for different crops. Uh, for leaf-footed bags, people use uh, Hubbard squash. They use, um, 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 they, uh, sorry, they use certain south, southern pea varieties that, to trap some of those leaf-footed bags uh, to deal with uh, the problem so that. And then with sting bags, uh, people use all kinds of stuff that we can, we can discuss later. But this is generally trapping your uh, pests at a location where, which is not so large, where you can focus your activities. We are not looking at using this, but there are other methods. People use what we call the salad vat, which is like a suction equipment that sucks off some of these insects that don't fly away. They are not skittish insects. Uh, you just basically keep moving and using suction, you, you pick up the, the, the insects that like a number of worms are picked up this way. Uh, there are all kinds of things that um, we can talk about, but uh, whilst I'm waiting for questions, uh, uh, let's see. Hey, I got, a, I got a question. Okay. What type of, uh, give me an yeah, example of a pesticide that is better to be sprayed, like you said, late in the evening so the sun doesn't react with it? Okay, we uh, the, the the pyrethrins like pyganic. Uh, have you ever used pyganic? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, the pyganic uh, is unstable um, in, in the presence of sunlight, uh, and if you spray it very early in the day and it's exposed to the sunlight, what happens is that it it, it, it breaks it down into a, a version that is not very active against the insects. So what we typically refer to as the residual activity gets even shorter. Uh, people add a product they, they call PBO to uh, pyrethrum, uh, that's from the chrysanthemum plant. They add the PBO, and the reason they add the PBO is that it makes it more stable to sunlight, but the problem is that once you add PBO, it's no longer considered an organic uh, insecticide. So let's be careful. There are certain pesticides you see that, was, that you'll be told the active ingredient is organic. It comes from a natural source. If it's not OMRI listed, 
uh, you have to be very careful. You have to look at your certifier or, uh, organization. If that's the only product you can use, you have to ask them whether you can use that because sometimes there are other ingredients or there are other constituents in that formulation that may not be organic. So uh, pyganic or uh, the active ingredient is pyrethrin is one of those um, that is unstable to sunlight. That's why we have the pyrethroids, which are the synthetic version, the conventional pesticide. They are very stable. They don't have any issues. Uh, they have a long, a much longer uh, residual activity. They, they keep doing the job on the treated surface much longer than the pyrethrum or the, the, the natural ones that we get from the chrysanthemum plant. Okay, good, thanks. <clears throat> You're welcome. So this right here has several different insects. We have the sting bugs. Uh, this was prepared by Dr. Chituri. Uh, we have sting bugs, we have leaf-footed bugs, we have uh, Colorado potato beetle. And now let me talk a little bit about this Colorado potato beetle. And uh, uh, let, uh, uh, Leslie, you can stop me at any point. Um, I'll keep going until you stop me. That's what I, wa I want to say. <laughs> <clears throat> that sounds good. Keep going. Okay. So this Colorado potato beetle. Anybody, I was just going to say, if anybody needs to drop off, go ahead and do so. Remember that we're recording this for your later viewing. Okay, these Colorado potato beetles, they are terrible. The reason they are terrible, and, and let me just say this right away. See, you have to be able to, add the, every pest you are dealing with, you have to be able to identify all the life stages because sometimes we are talking to you over the phone and we are asking you, how bad is the problem? And well, you've seen only one of these, but you've seen thousands of these. If you don't link this to this, you may not know that these are the immature forms of the Colorado potato beetle. So you may give us information that maybe you might tell me, oh, I just saw one of these. As well, if you just saw one on your entire field, you've not reached the treatment threshold. So just keep watching and don't spray anything. But that may be wrong advice because I got wrong information. You have to be able to link this, the immature one with the adult. One of the problems with the Colorado potato bill, they, they are biting insects, they chew uh, the leaves, they can skeletonize the leaf, they can just, they can eat the plant until only the midrib and the, <laughs> is left, and that is not good for the plant. Now, one of the issues with this is that they very quickly develop resistance to pesticides. So it's very key that you rotate your pesticides when you are using the, uh, going against the Colorado potato beetle. Another pro issue with them is that they are also very prolific. They have so many babies and very quickly and things get out of hand very quickly. Okay. We also have the flea beetles. And sometimes what you notice with flea beetles is that we have what we describe as short holes. It's like bullet holes, tiny bullet holes through the leaves. So sometimes you do not see the insect, but you have to look at the diagnostic damage that they do. So you have those tiny round bullet holes. Even if you don't see the flea beetles, you can tell they have to be somewhere not too far. Sometimes around your field, you may have uh, what we call pigweed, and they love pigweed. They love, they love to hide in pigweed. They love to feed on it. So if you are trying to control flea beetles, and you are looking at the, flea, uh, the pigweed around your field and you say, well, that's not on the farm. I don't have to worry about that. You have to realize that uh, they are magnets for flea beetles. The flea beetles feed on them and then they also hide them when they, they, they are no longer at a stage of life which is really attractive, they just move somewhere else. Trips, as you can see here, well, they cause all kinds of problems. Of course, they, their mouth parts are such that we, we, they have a mouth part we describe as rasping sucking. Basically what that mouth part does, it scratches the plant surface and when the uh, uh, fluids begin to ooze out, then they just uh, suck it. Well, they are very good at transmitting a number of diseases, mainly virus kind of diseases, which cause major problems for the plant and so you want to detect them early, deal with them as early as possible, so you don't have to deal with the virus issue, which like I said earlier, 
there is no product that we can give you to spray that. We have leaf hoppers as well, which also uh, transmit a number of viruses and stuff. And at this point, I would like to end. If there are any specific questions, I would address them. And um, if I'm unable to address them, Dr. Chituri is also online. She, 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 she can chip in at any point. And um, we keep moving on. Thanks so much for that awesome information, Dr. Korku. Um, now go ahead and ask any questions. Matthew Robinson, I see you on. Mr. Lansing, anybody have any questions? Looks like someone's joining us by phone as well. And make sure to unmute yourself if you want to yeah. talk because some of you are manually muted. <laughs> I'd like to uh, I'd like to address the issue of, of uh, wood chips for mulch on tomato plants. Uh, if you put a if you put uh, two inches of wood chips on uh, on the surface, uh, w would you um, uh, add any extra? Uh, uh, I'm using the four 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 from Italpolina. Uh, would you put any extra to compensate for the extra um, uh, uh, carbon in that wood chips, or, or what would you do? I understand what you are asking me. Uh, it has something, it is this carbon nitrogen ratio. But even though I have an idea on what you are talking about, it's outside my area of expertise. If Dr. Modley is online or somebody, I wouldn't want to address this question because I wouldn't do it much justice. Thank you. You're welcome. Sure thing. Dr. Mortley, are you still with us? Uh, he, uh, let's see. Looks like he is, but I don't hear I, him. I kind of hear him like way in the background, maybe. Dr. Pombleku uh, will be able to ad uh, address, if Dr. Modley is not available, Dr. Pombleku will be able to address this question because that falls right within what he does. He will be able to address this question and we, uh, we will make sure we get that answer back to you. Okay, thank you. But the key thing is that you want to be sure you don't, uh, uh, there's this thing we call the carbon nitrogen ratio. You want to be sure you are not overdoing one thing and then leaving the other one uh, not attended to the, it causes all kinds of problems. Um, but, but he will be the best person to address that. I can, I, I use wood chips on my home garden tomatoes. Yes. But <clears throat> I don't put it on until the tomatoes are, are planted and the weeds start growing. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the wood chips aren't really gonna break down into the soil. Mm -hmm. by the time that crops over but the next you know they say wood chips eventually are going to take up a lot of nitrogen as they're breaking down yeah and depending upon the plant that they are coming from sometimes uh, you, you want to watch what's going on with the ph of the soil and uh, all kinds of stuff and hey guys i'm 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 on now you hearing me yeah yeah we hear you Right, so both of you guys are on the right track. The wood chip does not take up the nitrogen, but as Dr. Quarker says, um, because you have all that excess carbon, then you have to provide, if you're going to use wood chips, you have to provide extra nitrogen because the microorganisms that are, you know, they have all the carbon they need, but they're going to need some nitrogen as well um to help you know build in their protein so because you have so much carbon you're going to use up so much nitrogen so you're going to have to you can use the wood chip but you have to add extra nitrogen to compensate thanks so much dr mortley all right okay all right do we have any any other questions Well, I promise to keep these lunchbox meetings within the hour. So if anyone does not have any other questions, we will go ahead and thank Dr. Korku 
uh, and also Dr. Taturi, uh, who is online with us, so who is available to answer any questions, and Dr. Mortley, of course, uh, Thomas over at Mississippi State, uh, who is on and is one of our partners as well. Thank you all so much for your input. Uh, any last, any last words on tomatoes? Not from me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's been a great information session, and we will be sure to get this recorded and online so that those that weren't with us can, can listen and view later. Everyone, have a great day. That's a wrap. Thank All you. Right, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.